morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you that we can be here to listen to your word and for you to speak to us. We pray, Lord, that what we don't know that you would teach us, what we don't have that you would give us, and what we are not that you would make us, for Jesus' sake. In Jesus, his name we pray. Amen. I was really ambitious saying I was going to go to verse 20. It's not going to happen. So <laughs> we'll get through something today, though. Don't you worry. Question for you. How many of you like to garden? How many of you like to plant things? Okay. We had more, actually, in first service. My father was an avid gardener. He loved to garden. He was pretty good at it, had a green thumb, tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, strawberries, beans. He loved to plant. Because he loved to plant to garden, I hate it. I absolutely hate it, and I'll tell you why. We had a, a tiny little yard when we lived in the South Bronx, tiny little yard in an apartment, and we got to play in it, and he, he said, when we get our own house, we'll have a nice big yard, and you can play. We got our own house, and he decided he was going to plant every square inch of it, and that's what he did. But that's not why I really hate it. Here's what happened. So when I was younger, and he planted, all I could do was pick. You know, that's all I was good for. He'd go, hey, it's red. We can pull it off. And I would go do that, and that was good. That was fun. But when we got older, and we had a bigger yard, now I had to help work. And we tilled up the whole yard, and he made little beds, and we, he dug the holes. And my job was to take the 50-pound bag of cow manure <laughs> and fill the holes. So we're out there, we did all the work, and now it's time to fill the holes before he plants. And he says, go get the manure. So I went and I picked up the bag of manure and I'm bringing it over. He opens the bag and he says, put the manure in the holes. How? With your hand. But it's cow poop. And then the line that I heard all throughout my life, did you hear what I said? <laughs> that line was said fast, it was said loud and heavily accented, and it meant, it was a rhetorical question, it didn't mean to, to, like he wanted an answer, go do what I just told you. So I started scooping the manure and putting it in the hole, all 50 stinking pounds of <laughs> it. And so I hate gardening, <laughs> all right? Now, James is talking to his readers about patient suffering. And he's going to use three examples of what patience looks like. The first is a gardener. And the second one, he's going to talk about the prophets of old and what they went through. And finally, he's going to end with Job. And we'll spend most of our time with Job because he's a great story. So he starts there, and James is circling back around to the same themes that he's touched on earlier in the book. James is all about practical Christian living, how it looks now that I am a Christian, what's the change in my life? And he starts off the book by saying, listen, when you fall into various trials, count it as joy. And we talked about that the first time. We said, how do you count something as joy? Well, you, it's not joyful to be in a trial. It's not joyful to go through suffering, we have to count it, reckon it, treat it as joyful, because what he explains to us in that first chapter is that it's working to mature us. It brings patience to our lives, and it matures us. We become complete Christians from what we learn through the suffering, so we're able to treat it that way. James talks a lot about the tongue, and if you listen to that passage, we're going to get to that, not today, but next time, because he's going to talk about grumbling, and he's going to talk about Giving, making oaths and what we should do when we do that. So he comes back around to these two major themes that he's had about suffering and the use of the tongue, the mouth. But he starts off here speaking about patient suffering, and he talks about farming. Now, the, the people of Israel, it's a little different, obviously, than we have today. When we want to water our garden, we turn on the hose, then we spray it. No big deal. They didn't have that. They had to wait on the rains. And it talks about the early and the latter rains. The, the early rains came that May, April, to April, May time, and the latter rains came October, November. And both were necessary for the crops to grow and to be harvested. If they didn't have the rain, they wouldn't be able to do it. Now, you can't rush the rain. If you want it to rain, you can't make it rain. They had to wait on God's purpose and God's timing. 
Now, here's the good part. God had told the people of Israel way back in the book of Deuteronomy that if they would follow his word, if they would obey him, that he would always send the rain when it was supposed to come. Always. And anytime you read in the Old Testament that the children of Israel were dealing with a famine or a drought, you can be sure that it was because they had disobeyed. God had promised in his word that this is what he was going to do, and so they knew it would happen. God said he would never not have the rain come as long as they listened. So they knew that that's what would happen. The problem was they disobeyed a lot, just like we do. We see the word of God, we see what it says, and we don't want to listen to it. We don't want to take it in as for us. We want to do, like Frank Sinatra said, our own thing. We want to do it my way. We want to have our own will be done. This is who we are as human beings. And they found out that they couldn't rush it. They had to wait on God's timing. When I was 16 years old, I planned out my life. And it was easy because when I was 16, I knew everything. All right? (laughs) So I was 16, and I knew that I was going to go to college, and I was probably going to go to law school after that, (laughs) And then I was going to find the one, didn't know who she was, but I was going to find her, and we were going to get married by 22. And then, for the next two years, we were going to have kids, four kids, 24, 26, 28, and 30. And so by the time we were 30, we'd have had all four of our kids, and everything would have been wonderful, we'd have been successful in raising our children. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't work out like that, okay? And thank God it didn't. What did I know? Absolutely nothing. I didn't get married until I was 40. 40. Matter of fact, I thought that I wasn't going to get married. I thought maybe God just wanted me to be single. But God's timing was different than mine, and guess what? It was better than mine. God knows. Now, I still got four kids. I got them all on the same day. (laughs) I couldn't have planned that. (laughs) But it worked out. God knew better than me. God wanted me to trust his timing for his plan. So the plan was good, but the timing was God's. Do we trust God's timing more than our own? It's an easy question when I say it like that. Of course God's timing is better. But when I'm actually going through something, when I'm actually suffering, do I believe that God's timing is best and that he's bringing me through something for a purpose? It's harder then. The farmers had to wait. James says that the farmers, look at the farmers, how patient they are. They have to wait for the rain to come so that the crops can grow and be harvested. In the same way, we have to wait for God's timing. We have to be patient through God's timing, until he brings us to where he wants us to be. God is going to bring us to where he wants us to be. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't mess up. He doesn't have a plan B. Whatever God has planned, that's what's going to happen. We need to make our plans come in line with his. So that's the first one. He talked about farmers. Then after that, he talks about the prophets of old and what they went through. And on the prophets of old... When I think of them, I always think about Jeremiah first, because Jeremiah had a rough job. God told him really early on that he had called him and that he had set him apart to speak to kings and nations and to speak to rulers and that he was going to be God's spokesman. Great job. And then he says to him in chapter 7, verse 27 of Jeremiah's book, so you shall speak all these words to them but they will not listen to you. You're going to be my spokesman. You're going to go before kings and rulers. You're going to tell them all these words that I've spoken to you, and no one's going to listen to you. That's rough. Would that take patience and perseverance and steadfastness to go before people who you would give a message to and you know that they're not going to listen? Every parent knows how that feels, right? Sorry. um, But that's what Jeremiah was called to, to come before people, to speak to them, and God says, they're not going to listen to you. 
Later in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 37, I believe it is, he is giving the message to the king because Babylon, the, this great world power is coming and they're going to take the people of Jerusalem and take them away to cap, in captive. And he says that, listen, this is what's going to happen. They're going to come in and, they're going to, and it's going to happen. You can't stop it. And they take Jeremiah because they don't want to hear the truth. They take Jeremiah and they throw him in an open cistern, a pit that they used to collect water. And they had no water in it. It was just mud. And he's sinking into the mud and he would have died if someone had not come and put ropes under his arms and pulled him up out of the pit. He gets persecuted for speaking the truth. Our society isn't big on the truth anymore. I actually listened to a woman. I'm not sure if she's a professor or not. I don't want to say that incorrectly. But she was explaining that 2 plus 2 does not necessarily equal 4. She said 2 plus 2 could be 5. And if you think that it can only be 4, you're narrow-minded and racist. <laughs> Math is racist? When did that happen? I couldn't believe it. Listen, what's the one question that can't be answered right now from the transgender movement? What is a woman? How'd that become a hard question? When we don't want truth, we'll go to anything. Literally anything. Adult, human, female, woman. Pretty easy, you would think, right? But when you don't want to believe that, you can't answer it. When you don't want truth, you will believe any lie. Any lie. And it doesn't matter how outrageous it is, you will believe it. The Bible is the standard. What I feel, what I think, has to come under the authority of God's word. If what I feel and what I think doesn't match up with the truth of God's word, then guess what? I am wrong. And I need to bring myself under the subjection of the authority of God's word. If I decide this afternoon that my mortgage is paid, thank you, Lord. <laughs> that doesn't mean that the bank agrees with me. And guess what? The bank will not agree with me until it's done. I don't get to just feel something or think something and it be true. We don't create our own reality. The Word of God grounds us. The Word of God governs us. And everything I think or feel comes under the authority of God's Word. There is truth. We have the gardeners. They need to be patient. They have to farm. They have to wait for the rains. We have the, the, the prophets of old, and they needed to be patient because the people didn't want the truth. When Stephen was speaking before the council, he said, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, whom you, who you, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. The writer to the, of the book of Hebrews says it like this. He says that people suffered. They suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. And then I love this phrase, of whom... The world was not worthy. They wandered about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. This was what happened to those who spoke the truth. Folks, truth is not held highly in our society any longer. And those of us who speak truth from a platform like this to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to our family members, we will find increasing persecution. I pray that God gives us the strength to stand up for what is true, for what is real, for what is right. <clears throat> Jesus said that he's the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father but by him. If that's not true, then I shouldn't have a job. I shouldn't be up there. I'm wasting time. The Bible tells us that if Jesus didn't die and raise from the dead, then we're of, most, of all men, we're the most miserable. But we're not because we do know the truth of what God's word says and we proclaim it. And I pray that God will help us to give us the strength to do that 
regardless of the situation and circumstance, with both love and with truth. Gardeners, they had to be patient. The prophets of old, they had to be patient. They had to have perseverance. They had to hold on to what they knew was true, even as they went through tough times. And who is that more true of than Job? And he's the last guy we get to. Job. The story of Job. The Bible tells us that he was an upright man, he was blameless, that he, Old King James says, he eschewed evil. I love the word eschew because it was on my SAT and I got it right <laughs> because of Job chapter 1. <laughs> he shunned evil, the Bible tells us. He, the Bible says he had 10 children, seven boys, three girls, and it says when they went to have a good time at one of their, one of their siblings' homes, that Job would go and he would sacrifice for each of them just in case one of them had done something wrong. This is who Job was. He was an upright man. And we're going to see what happens to him. So we're going to take a little detour from James here and we'll slide over to Job for a minute. We'll just read a few verses there. Starting in in Job, Job chapter 1, there was a day, the Bible tells us, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, I don't know how that works out, but Satan does still have access to the throne room, access to speak to God. And Satan, the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. That's a lie, by the way. He was at Job's doorstep. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. His possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, All that he has is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Satan asks a question about Job that every one of us needs to answer. What Satan said about Job is that Job is not serving you. Job is not worshiping you simply for you. Job is worshiping you for what you give him. If you take away what you've given to him, he'll curse you to your face. Do I worship God for God himself, or do I worship God for what he's given to me? Home, job, car, family, Are those the reasons why I worship God? If those are taken away, will I still worship God? If all the things that you hold dear are taken from you, all the things that you love in this life are taken from you, will you still worship God? That's the question. Do I worship God for who he is, or do I worship him for what I get from him? Listen, this is why the prosperity gospel is is so prevalent, because it makes sense to us. It's, it's, God scratched my back, so I'll scratch his. It's quid pro quo, tit for tat. It's, okay, if I give you $50, you're going to bless me, and you'll give me even more. That appeals to us because it makes sense. I give to you, you give to me. That's how it works, Right? Do I worship God for who he is or simply for what he gives me? If everything's taken away, do I worship still? Everything is going to be taken away from Job in a single day. This has got to be the worst day of his life. He's there at home, and the Bible tells us that messengers came. Four messengers come, one after the next. And the first one comes, and he tells them that this raiding party came, and they stole all of his cattle. And then he loses all of his camels and his mules and his donkeys, and he's lost all of his wealth. And then... The last messenger comes in while the last one is still talking 
And he says, all of your kids were together in their oldest brother's house. And this wind came and just blew the house down. And all of them perished. And I'm the only one who escaped. And I'm here to tell you about it. In one moment, he's lost all of his wealth and his ten children. Ten. There are people in this room who've lost children. I can't imagine what that feels like, to lose your child. All ten of his children dead at the same time. Can you see ten graves and all of his kids are there? And on top of that, he has nothing left? And the Bible tells us that Job tore his robe, shaved his head, and worshipped. He said, naked I came out of my mother's womb, naked I'll return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He worshiped. He worshiped at that moment in that situation. Job was not worshiping God for what he could get. He was worshiping God for who God was. Because when it was all taken away, he still blessed God. The Bible tells us that in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. Satan's not done, though. You know the story. There's another day when the the sons of God are presenting themselves before the Lord, and Satan comes again, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? He says the same thing again. And Job, excuse me, Satan says, listen, skin for skin, a man will give everything that he has to save himself. And God says, okay, you can do what you want, except do not take his life. And so after this, after Job has lost all of his children, all of his wealth, now it says that he was smitten with running sores, with boils from the bottom of his foot to the top of his head. It was so bad that he is sitting in an ash heap, which is probably a garbage heap, sitting in an ash heap, with a broken piece of pottery just scraping the sores. It's terrible. Job is suffering. None of us would would deny that. None of us would dispute that. Look at what has happened to him. And he wants relief. He wants this to go away. He wants to find out why this is happening to him. Listen, we look at Job now as this wonderful example of patience and suffering, of persevering through the hard times. Job wasn't trying to be an example. Job was trying to get to tomorrow. He just needed the next day. He wanted this to end. And then as bad as things are, now his friends come. And you laugh because you know how this goes. For the first seven days... They show up and they see how terrible the grief is that he's going through. It says that they saw him from afar off and they didn't even recognize him. And they come to Job and they sit down with him in the ashes for seven days and no one speaks because they saw that his grief was so very great. In Job chapter 3, Job begins to speak. And he curses the day he was born. And he says he wishes that he'd been stillborn. And he wants to die. That's how bad things have gotten. Curses the day he was born. He wanted to be stillborn. He's begging God to just take his life. Why should I go on any longer? It's bad. And then his friends begin to speak. His friends come to him, and the first guy who speaks is a man named Eliphaz. And in Job chapter 4, verse 7, Eliphaz says, Look, Job, who being innocent ever perished? And this is going to be the theme of what all of his friends say for the rest of the book. It's wonderful poetic language. They go on for chapters upon chapters, but this is basically what they say. Job, you're not innocent. There's no way that you would be suffering like this if you hadn't done something really, really bad. And you need to repent. And there are dialogues between them going back and forth, and the three friends speak, and Job speaks, but that's the the gist of the argument. Job, you've done something wrong. And you need to repent. 
We know Job hasn't done anything wrong. We can go to the book of Job and see why this occurred. But Job has no idea why he's suffering. Many times, you and I will have no idea why we're suffering. I want you to believe this, that there is a purpose and a plan behind every moment that you spend suffering. God does not have you suffering for no reason. That's not who he is. God is a loving Heavenly Father, and anything, anything that he allows into your life is for a purpose and a reason. It's not always easy to believe that, especially when you're in the middle of it, but it's the truth. We ground our lives on the truth so that when the hard times come, we know what we can hold on to. Job is suffering. Job has said that all I want to do is meet God. I want to be able to talk to God and say, ask him, why is this happening? Why am I going through this? Why am I suffering in this way? He's like, I haven't done anything. I don't know, and I wish I could just speak to God. And the problem that Job has more than anything else that God is completely silent. He hasn't heard anything from him. He doesn't know why. We don't know why. Can you imagine this for a second? I have three kids at home. We have one who is doing college. He's he's finished senior in high school, so he's going both to high school and to OCC, and he also works at Wegmans. The middle one, he plays volleyball for school, club volleyball, and tennis for school. Littlest one plays volleyball for school, club volleyball, and track and field for the school. It's too much for me to keep in my head. (laughs) I can't keep it all straight. I've got my wife, which is great, so I ask her, I said, who's got practice today? Are we at the middle school? Are we at the high school? Who's picking up who from where? I have to drop off somebody else's kid somewhere. It's just always going. And one day, while I was relaxing at home, I got a phone call. And I picked up the phone. Hello? (laughs) Mr. McCall? Yes? Your daughter is still here at school. Whoops. <laughs> I'll be right there. <laughs> I'll be right there to pick her up. It's just, it's a lot. It's too much for me to keep in my mind. Eight billion people on the planet right now. God is working everyone's life out to an end. God is working everybody's life out Everybody's story is working together to what Ephesians chapter 1 puts like this. That everything is set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. God has an overriding plan for everything and everyone that's working together. Can you imagine the mind that it takes to do that? And it's not anything hard for him. He's not sweating this. He's not worried about if Pastor Stephen has to get home and make lunch today. He knows everything that's going on. It's all under his control, and it's all working towards an end. So if he had to explain to me why I'm going through something and where that fits in the plan, Do you think I'd understand? I wouldn't. I couldn't understand. You couldn't understand. Every now and again, God peels back a little bit of the layers and he shows us why something might have happened, but that's not the norm. Many times in our lives, we go through things and we have no idea why. We always say that we would understand or we could deal with it better if we just knew why. We wouldn't because we couldn't understand it. We need to put ourselves under God's authority, that he is sovereign and that he can do what he wants, even if we don't understand it. Job talks for the majority of the book that he wants to see God, he wants to meet God, he wants to understand, and finally God comes to speak to him. And to me, this is the hard part of the book. Because God comes to speak to him in a tornado. He comes in a tornado and he starts firing questions at Job about creation and about the nature and and how things work 
in, in the world, in the universe. And after a couple of chapters of that, Job says, it's enough. He says, I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke about what I don't know. And God's not finished. He goes through another couple of chapters with giving him question upon question upon question until Job finally repents and says, you know more than I know, I bow before you. That's my paraphrase. I bow before you. I can't understand what's going on. That's not how any of us would have answered Job. When I want to answer Job, if I'm God, I want to come and put my arm around Job and tell him, Job, I'm so sorry you had to go through this, and you don't understand what happened, but listen, this is what happened. Satan came, and he had this whole thing, and I said, have you considered my servant Job? That's what we would have done, right? That's how we would have answered Job. But that's not what God gives him. It does not seem comforting, but Job is comforted by it. Why is Job comforted by it, even though it seems harsh? Because Job now realizes that he can't control this, that he has to be patient, that he has to persevere, and that he has to hold on to what he already believes. The same thing that you and I have to do when we go through suffering. We must be patient. We must persevere. And we must hold on to what we already know is true, that God is good, that he's a loving father, and that nothing that happens to us is without a purpose. I want to go back to Eliphaz's question. Eliphaz is the first guy to speak, and he says to Job, Job, when did anyone who was innocent perish? I can think of a time. His name is Jesus. The innocent one is perishing for each and every one of us. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us that the just died for the unjust. What? Does that make sense? The just for the unjust? The righteous for the unrighteous? And it tells us why. To bring us to God. Jesus dies. The only truly innocent person in the world dies so that we can be brought to God so that we can have relationship with God, so that we can have sins forgiven, and that we can have Jesus as our Savior. He dies. When did the righteous ever die? When did the innocent ever die? When did they perish? Jesus Christ. He takes our place, dies for our sin, and brings us to God. Ephesians 1.9, we read that. 1 Peter 3.18. I'll just read the whole thing. Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. We can't think of God as being cold, impersonal, or far away. And I know how hard that is if you're in the middle of something. But he's not. Jesus gets abandoned and forsaken so that none of us ever need to be. So that he is always there for us. And today, we can persevere through suffering. We can be patient with what we're going through as we hold on to the truth that Jesus is our Savior, that God is love, and that God is is good. I pray that you would be able to hold on to that whatever you're going through. If it's now or if it's something that happens in the future, because God is good and he's good to each and every one of us.